This is part two of the lecture on facial fractures. In my opinion, these are the seven critical fractures of the face. To be fair, I base that opinion on discussions with surgeons here at my institution. But I think that these fractures are so important that they belong in every dictation for facial fractures, even if only to say that they are absent. We're going to just march through this list and talk about each one in greater detail. I've ordered these critical fractures from superior to inferior because that's how I march through looking for them when I look at a CT scan. We'll start with the frontal sinus. The frontal sinus fractures are important because there is a risk of infection if the posterior table is disrupted and things move from the sinus into the intracranial vault. There's a risk of CSF leak if things move from the intracranial vault into the sinus. And even just mucosal disruption, if there's no leak at all, even just mucosal disruption has a high risk of leading to a mucosal. Some of the important things to discuss when you are dictating a frontal sinus fracture. Involvement of the anterior table versus the posterior table. Both are important, but the posterior table, as I was saying, has a different set of risks. Involvement of the intersinus septum, the wall between the left and right frontal sinus, that is also an important structure to discuss. Displaced fractures are of higher risk than non-displaced fractures, so identifying fragments that are displaced and describing their anatomic location is important. Here's an example of a non-displaced fracture extending through the left frontal sinus. You can see that both the anterior table and the posterior table are involved. There's blood filling the sinus, but there's only minimal displacement of the fragments. Here is a more complex fracture where there are displaced fragments of both the anterior and posterior table of the frontal sinus. The fracture line extends through the intersinus septum and there are comminuted components of all of these fractures. Here's an example where the posterior table is intact but there is a displaced anterior table fragment that is posteriorly displaced and you can see how this has disrupted the intersinus septum and caused some redundancy in that bone. Remember that these frontal sinus fractures may extend into surrounding structures. You can see where this fracture plane that comes through the roof of the frontal sinus continues down into the orbital roof. Now let's turn our attention to the zygomatic arch. The zygomatic arch is very important to surgeons in part because of its cosmetic effects. When we look at a person, the symmetry of their face, and particularly the symmetry of their cheekbones, is something that we are trained to notice very quickly. The zygomatic arch is the keystone for support of the entire midface. Sometimes radiologists approach these fractures as though they were easy to diagnose or just mentioned in passing. So it's important to recognize that these are critical fractures and are of surgical importance and need to be brought to the fore in your dictations. When you are dictating the details of a zygomatic arch fracture, indicate whether it is a single fracture or whether there are segmental fractures, multiple fractures in the arch. There is an important concept of interzygomatic distance. If the zygomatic arch is blown inward, we call that decreased interzygomatic distance. And if it is blown outward, we call that increased interzygomatic distance. Zygomatic arch fractures are prone to deformity fractures, what we call green stick fractures in children. Even in adults, the zygomatic arch may fracture without showing a discrete lucent line and instead just showing deformity of the normal zygomatic arch curvature. In this case, symmetry is your friend. Look at the degree of curvature of the contralateral zygomatic arch and see if you can identify a deformity on the affected side. Here's an example of a patient with 
severe facial fractures, you can see that the zygomatic arch has segmental disruption. You can see that there are basal fractures as well as two fractures along the arch. And these fracture fragments are blown out on both sides, so we have increased interzygomatic distance. Here's a situation in which the zygomatic arch is deformed. You can see that the curvature of the arch is not the nice, smooth, uniform curvature that we are accustomed to, but instead sweeps in and then sweeps back out again. Now, you would be tempted in a situation like this to say, that's an old fracture, it's remodeled, I don't see an acute fracture line. But in fact, in this case, this is an acute fracture. Maybe with enough imagination you can see the anterior component, but I would say that this is an occult fracture based only on lucencies. So you need to look at these deformed arches with a certain degree of skepticism, even for acute fractures. You can see the other components of the tripod fracture that we'll discuss later in the lecture. That's another clue that you're dealing with an acute fracture. Let's talk about orbital fractures. Orbital fractures are of critical importance because when you have a blowout fracture of the orbit and a component of one of the orbital walls is displaced outward, you have effectively changed the volume of the orbit. What this means is that the globe now can fall back into the orbit, and once that fracture heals, you'll end up with enophthalmos. That's usually not obvious when the patient presents, because there's so much swelling and hematoma in the orbit that, in fact, they're exophthalmic. It's not until that swelling goes away that we can see the degree of enophthalmos that results from the increased orbital volume. Also, the anchoring ligaments for the globe itself can be disrupted in these orbital fractures, and you can end up with diplopia. Some of the important things to discuss when you are dictating orbital fractures is extent. Does the fracture extend all the way to the orbital rim and involve the orbital rim itself, or is it confined to one of the walls? Is it a blowout fracture that results when the globe itself is driven back into the orbit with a sudden increase in intraorbital pressure and one of the walls just gives out. Is it a trapdoor fracture? Now, I think people overuse that term. A trapdoor fracture should be used when a blowout fracture opens up and then closes again. Just because a blowout fracture is hinged at one side does not make it a trapdoor fracture. It has to close again to use the term trapdoor fracture, and those are interesting because they may be radiologically occult. You may not be able to see the fracture line once the trapdoor closes, and the only evidence may be the herniated orbital contents. Speaking of herniations, there's two words that are sometimes used interchangeably but should not be. Herniation and entrapment. Entrapment is a clinical diagnosis. The radiologist has no business making a diagnosis of entrapment. Entrapment occurs when there is dysfunction of one of the extraocular muscles because it is trapped within a fracture or upon a bony spur. Herniation is something we can describe. If the contents of the orbit have extended into an area where they don't belong, either into the sinuses or occasionally upward towards the intracranial vault, that's herniation and that we can detect. One of the most important things to discuss in orbital fractures is the size of the defect. Different institutions have different ways of measuring the area or estimating the area of the defect. And you should discuss with your surgeons how they would prefer that you express this. Some people would like to see it as a percentage of the orbital floor. Some surgeons would prefer to measure it as a, uh, a combination of the anterior, posterior, and medial lateral dimensions of the fracture fragment. So it, it varies from institution to institution, and uh, you should find out what's used at your site. Here's an example of blowout fractures of the right orbit. You can see that the normal contour of the orbital floor, which should be about here, you know, judging from the other side, should be about here 
All of these fracture fragments have been displaced inferiorly, and you can see the orbital fat herniating through into the maxillary sinus. Interestingly, large fractures like this rarely result in entrapment. It is the smaller fractures that can entrap the extraocular muscles. Notice here that the inferior rectus muscle has accompanied the herniated fat and is herniated in its own right. Don't forget to look at the lamina papyrusia. It's another common site, not as common as the floor, but another common site for fractures, blowout fractures with herniation. Be very careful looking for fat where it doesn't belong. In this example, we have a, pa a trauma patient and there's blood within the ethmoid air cells, but that's not enough of an indication that there is a fracture. It's suggestive, but not a strong indication. The presence of this fat within the ethmoid air cells, however, is a strong indicator that there is an underlying fracture, and you should be very careful looking for it. So once we move to the coronal plane, I think it's easier to see the herniated orbital fat through the small defect and, in fact, herniation of the medial rectus muscle, which turned out to be clinically entrapped in this patient. Here's an example of a trapdoor fracture. Notice that the fracture fragments have returned now almost to anatomic alignment. Nevertheless, there is a large quantity of herniated material, including the inferior rectus muscle. How do I know that's not just hematoma? Well, I can count the rest of the extraocular muscles. I see four out of the five that I should see at this level posterior to the globe. All right, I see the superior and inferior rectus muscles, the medial and lateral rectus muscles, and the superior oblique muscle, along with the optic nerve sheath complex, on the unaffected side, but that inferior rectus muscle missing from the affected side. This is an example to discuss the extent of the fracture to the orbital rim. Notice how we are all the way out at the rim of the orbit. That is the most anterior aspect of the orbit, right where the bone ends. That is the orbital rim, and you can see that this fracture through the floor has extended to the orbital rim. This is important because when we are surgically repairing these fractures, we like to put a new shelf in place to replace the orbital floor, and that shelf needs to be able to rest on something. So knowing whether these fractures go all the way to the orbital rim and knowing whether they go all the way back to the orbital apex is an important aspect of assessing these fractures. When we see an orbital fracture that extends all the way back to the orbital apex or even into the skull base, that is an indicator of a large degree of force. You really have to hit someone's face hard to fracture this far back. Another thing that's really important to look for when we are assessing fractures that go to the apex is whether the optic canal has been involved. Here's our optic canal, and when we see a fracture that extends to the optic canal, that is a telephone call, in my opinion, to the referring surgeons because they need to know about that emergently. The optic canal is a bottleneck. It's a very tight space for that nerve, and a small amount of hematoma can exert a tremendous amount of pressure on the optic nerve. These patients sometimes are not in condition to express their worsening vision, and so we need to be able to see that on the radiologic images and report it to the surgeons so that they can decompress these patients if necessary. This concludes part two of the lecture on facial fractures. We're stopped right in the middle of the critical fractures of the face, but we'll pick right back up again in part three.